good to get some whoops. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, Slush, day two. Thrilled to be here. Hope you're having a wonderful time. Um, so I'm sure many of you were here yesterday for the uh, State of European Technology presentation from Atomico uh, when Tom Vermeer told us the State of European Tech. And there were lots of many great things uh, that we discovered. Investment in European tech reached a record 23 billion last year. European founders created 17 billion dollar companies. Uh, Europe produced three of the 10 biggest venture-backed public listings. It's a major driver of economic growth in Europe. But, and it's a big but, there is a huge diversity and inclusion challenge in European tech. One stat really stands out, well, there's many that stand out, but 93% of funds raised by European venture-backed firms in 2018 went to all-male founding teams. There is one female CTO out of 175 CTO, sorry, CTOs that work at VC-backed European tech companies that raised Series A or Series B last year. And the uncomfortable truth is that the technology industry today is not a place where everyone, regardless of gender, race, disability, religion, sexuality, or socioeconomic background, can thrive and succeed. So what are we going to do? Well, today we're going to have a conversation from two people who are really trying to address this issue uh, and this very kind of urgent challenge that we all face. Um, this year's State of European Tech report from Atomico partnered with Diversity VC to create a practical guide, a toolkit that's intended to help anyone leading, working, or investing in technology companies to, provide, to promote diversity and inclusion uh, in their business. So to discuss the guide here today, we have Nicholas Zenstrom from Atomico and Francesca Czech Warner from Diversity VC. So just to kick us off, Czech, if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about Diversity VC. Yeah, so Diversity VC is a nonprofit. We're made up of a group of interested individuals. We all work in some capacity in the VC industry. And our mission is to promote diversity in tech um, in all of its forms. We kind of do four things. We collect and publish original data. We help young people get into the industry from all kinds of backgrounds. We help VCs themselves to be more inclusive through a training program and a VC-specific toolkit. And then we help entrepreneurs access capital. And we started out last year by doing a study which was the first ever study on the number of women in VC in the UK, which revealed that two thirds of funds had no senior women in their investment teams, and only 13% of partners in UK funds were female. Um, it, it's really important to say that we are looking at the diversity issue in its broadest sense, so we're not just looking at gender, but that study gave us a real kind of indication of how bad the problem was today. This report is actually the first thing we've done for entrepreneurs, and we're really, really excited to partner with Atomico to do that. What it is, is, as you said, a, a really practical toolkit. Um, it includes eight case studies from uh, founders of companies from 10 people up to 500 plus people. Uh, so the idea is that it's you know, people talking about where they're at on their journey, not saying that they're perfect, but it's a starting point for a great conversation. So, Nicholas, the um annual European sort of state of tech report that you, you guys produce every year. It's very much a, uh, a, a benchmark. It really does indicate the, the, the state of European tech. Why did you decide this year? What, what kind of uh, pr provoked you to sort of really yeah. think, okay, we need to address this issue? Yeah, it, it is a huge issue. And you can, you can look at this from a few different areas. One is, like, if you purely look at this from a performance point of view, uh, which are the best company? How can a company perform better? How can investment perform better? It turns out that studies shows us that a diverse team performs much better than a non-diverse team. So there's a business case. For it's this a real business case. Else, yeah. So and of course, this is really the right thing. This is it. There is no reason why uh, the tech world should be so small. Yeah. And one of the biggest challenges that all companies have is talent how to access talents, how to find more talent. So if we broaden the talent pool, we will be more competitive. Yeah. So I think it's important maybe to sort of like now look at very specifically VC and the role of VCs in, in this issue. Check, how do you see VCs being able to really have an impact and to sort of like drive change? 
Yeah, I mean, the reason we started as an organization with VC was because we thought that VCs had a disproportionate impact on the companies they fund. Right. And the, the thing about tech companies is they often are growing very, very fast. And um, the problem compounds. If you don't get them the, the, the sort of solution right at the very beginning, then the problem, you know, when you're a company of tens of thousands of people, mm. is actually really, really difficult to then subsequently fix. Yeah. Um, so we think that VCs have kind of two major roles to play. One is making it a priority and actually you know, talking to the, to the founders of the companies that they're backing in their meeting all the time and saying, you know, this is something that we really need to see from you in order to kind of work with us. And the second thing is using their resources and using their networks to actually source talent across the whole portfolio. Right. Because VCs can kind of leverage themselves uh, and, and you know, build those networks to make those key hires for those companies from day one. Sure, and, and, and Nicholas, from your experience, does this resonate for you in terms of um, just you know the, the cultural fit with the kind yeah. of um, you know startups that you maybe yeah. want to back? Yeah. So, uh, going back to this whole thing about hiring people, because that's all what it's about. We have conversations today with 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 founders before we make an investment, and we talk about how they think about diversity, um, how they think about values and and, and culture. And that gives us a really good clue if this company is going to be successful or not. Because founders who are leaning forward and saying, yes, I understand that uh, being inclusive, thinking about diversity and building a strong value set early on, those are the companies that have a much better chance to build a sustainable, long-term, profitable company. If founders don't really care about this, this is going to be a really, really big red flag for us. So we use this now already in the screening process. And we're asking these questions about diversity, how you think about it, um, and, and what you're going to do about it. So I think also when we as a VC community are starting asking these questions before we make an investment, I think over time, this is something that maybe become a standard that companies, they know that when they need to raise money from a VC firm, they need to think already about diversity. Mm -hmm. So I think we can really raise the bar. And you know, when a VC firm comes in, what we do is also, of course, introduce governance, that we're putting a board together, and the first time that the company started to think about how they should think about governance. Mm -hmm. so, so this is the time when we also need to include uh, diversity and inclusion on the board level. So kind of raising these, these questions when we look at hiring plans. And, and so that, that's, I think, that's one, one of the things that we can really play a role. Mm -hmm. And would you consider, sorry, Chuck. No, I was just to say, to this point, I think it's interesting to kind of ask yourselves the question, if you do run a company, when was the last time you had diversity and inclusion policy as a standing agenda item or yeah. as any agenda item on your board pack. Yeah. And kind of as a VC, you know, often you get appointed yeah. to a board at these early stages and sort of insisting that that's at least discussed mm -hmm. can have a massive impact. So maybe, Nicholas, would you consider um, ensuring that, uh, you know, a potential portfolio company, uh, that this is, this is kind of baked into the, to the term sheet? So it's, it's yeah. Been... So we actually we introduced that in our term sheet this year. Um, that uh, companies that don't have a um, diversity and inclusion policy that we require them to, to put one in all, six months after investment. And that's something that, like, that's, that's the easy win. It's like, so far, everyone thinks, that's great that you asked that for me. No one is like, so far, no, no one of the companies we're investing in have a problem with this. Sure. So it's just putting this on the agenda and, and also, of course, <clears throat> raising this at a board meeting. And what you said, Czech, is very rare that I've seen board materials that talks about diversity and inclusion. So that's something we, I would say, like if we check in, in a year from now, success would be that most board materials have this in, in their, yeah. in, in their, um, in, in, in the board meetings, in yeah. the board material. And the, you know, this is where yeah. this kind of came from. It was about making it as easy as possible for people yeah. to implement something. This is completely free. Please send it to all of your companies and, and use it because, and, and add to it because we, we want this to be a resource that yeah. people can really easily just slot into their companies. Yeah, yeah so, well, this is, this is the, th the part I think we should really get into because I think this is the key for, for, for everyone here to understand that this is, this is a toolkit. This is something that can yeah. be used. It's practical. And maybe, check you can kind of just take us through what that roadmap in terms of the practical steps that startups, you know, Nicholas was saying, you know, so maybe some startups, they don't have... Uh, they, they have the will, but they don't necessarily know how to do it. What does yeah. that roadmap look like? Yeah. So the first thing is about understanding the topic um, and actually prioritizing it. So as a leadership team, you know, saying 
this is a year, you know, for 2019, we're actually going to look at this and we're going to make this a priority. In terms of understanding it, you know, it's not like, you know, how do you scale to a new country? It's not, it's a much more complex and nuanced topic. So, you know, really recommend spending proper time understanding the deep nuances of diversity and inclusion, the reasons why our industry today is not as inclusive as it should be. The second thing is about planning and really making sure that you're talking to all the different communities in your workforce. And also thinking about communities that are not currently represented in your workforce and thinking about how you can bring those people in in the future. Then it's about implementation and looking at uh, how you hire, you know, it's a, it's a key part, um, how you kind of onboard and how you actually create an inclusive culture, because it's all very well hiring people in who are from diverse backgrounds, but unless they feel like they can thrive and succeed and do well in the company, then that's not going to end very well. And then thirdly, product design, you know, thinking about how people actually access your products um, and how they can kind of um, use them. And then finally, building in kind of feedback loops to allow everyone in the company to give their view on what they think you know, has been achieved by the diversity and inclusion focus and how it could be changed and how it could be improved. Because the research and our understanding on this topic is just constantly changing and evolving. So it's not like you know, once you put this in place, you can just kind of forget about it and move on. Yeah. You need to constantly keep updating it. I was going to ask that question, actually. So once it's been put in place, it's, that's not then an excuse for startups just to say, great, we've done that. Let's get on with growing and, and scaling. This is something yeah. that needs to be done as a kind of like just constantly being iterated, right? Yeah, and it's about a communication channel ultimately and actually involving and including your, your employees in that conversation. Yeah. And I think that the case studies, if you look at the back here, you know, these eight case studies, a really strong theme that constantly came through was the companies that were engaging in their own uh, in the conversations with their own employees were the ones that seemed to be doing best on implementing the policies sure. that people were happiest with. And does that change according to the stage that a company's at? Presumably, it's far easier to think very early on, OK, we're going to bake this into our business. But when organizations get l larger, it's, 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 it's more of a challenge. Are there, different, are there different kind of case studies here between those kind of different kinds of businesses? Yeah. So one of the case studies we have in here is Monzo, for example, which is one of the you know, very exciting challenger banks in the UK. And, and they are actually the company that has the, the one CTO who's female um, in, in the Atomico uh, report. And um, you know, that's a really interesting example of a company of over 500 people as it's scaling. And I think it's about sort of making sure that the priority is also through the whole line. So every single line manager has this as a reporting kind of line up to the leadership and they know that this is a serious priority. So Nicholas, from your perspective, when you're thinking about maybe adding, you know, making an investment to add a, a company to the portfolio, would you decide if they, even if the business was extremely exciting and you thought it had real potential, would you decide maybe not to make an investment if you felt there wasn't the right culture shift in terms mm -hmm. of their, uh, you know, a founder's yeah. attitude towards uh, diversity and yeah. inclusion? I think the key question here, or key word here is, is attitude to it. Because yeah. there's a lot of teams that we see at the very, very early stage which are not diverse. And that, that, then we, like, we, we see that you know, the presentation, they come to us, or maybe they say, here's our team. It's like, OK, there's all yeah. white males. Yeah. Okay. Then we ask the questions like, how do you think about that? Um, and if they don't think about it, and when we kind of prompt them a little bit if they think it's an issue, if they don't think it's an issue, think it's a, not, nothing to focus about, that will give, that's a red flag. But if they think about, yes, this is, we, we're aware of this, and we really, we really, really want to build, we understand it's important to build a, a diverse team, but it's really hard so far when we got started. If they lean in and understand the issue, then, then that's good. If they don't understand it and they don't, want to understand it, that's, that's a red flag. Because yeah. it's about building a great a, a team that can be you know, not only big, but also a diverse and well-performing team. So I think that I, I really doubt, seriously, that companies that are ignoring diversity can be a long-term sustainable great business. Yeah. And that's, that, that's why we would kind of really step away from th that kind of companies. The other thing I was going to say was that when both companies, when we meet them when we, before we invest, but also we went out to all our portfolio companies earlier this year and asked them, how do you think about diversity? Do you have a diversity policy in place? Mm -hmm. And pretty much everyone thought it was important, but very, not everyone, actually less than half, had a policy in place. And they said, that's great, yeah, we want to have one, but then, then they ask us, but how do we do it? And it's like, we don't know. <laughs> 
So that's why we kind of started to have this conversation with Czech. It's like, OK, we actually need to help out here. But what's really, really great here also, just connecting pe um, founders together and start talking to us. So then there's also a peer learning thing here. So what we hope that we will achieve with, with this is like, this is, a, this is the launch of this report, or this, this toolkit, or this guide. What we really want this to be is, is a first iteration, and th then that this is something that can become built on experiences from, from teams that are using this and giving feedback. And then there's, we're going to have a lot of peer learning, hopefully, so that it can be really, really fruitful. So 88% say that having a diverse team is a benefit to company performance. I mean, all the evidence that we have yeah. suggests that actually, other than being the right thing to do, the ethical thing to do, the responsible thing to do, is actually a really strong business case yeah. for this, right? Yeah. But and I think it's also a point we were talking about earlier is the idea of creating global companies, which Tom mentioned earlier. And you know, one of the things we're really doing in Europe particularly is creating companies that can compete on a global scale. Yeah. And having companies, you know, the teams of companies actually represent the global society that we're yeah. in rather than just a very small subset of it is a really key part of understanding yeah. customers and hopefully getting to that successful global outcome. In terms of, so Nicholas was just talk, uh, talking about uh, sort of startups that he's meeting, uh, sort of f f relatively early stage. There's obviously challenges when you're a larger company. There was uh, a, a news story last week about a, a, a guy at Facebook who posted a story about there were disproportionately few African Americans working for uh, for Facebook. Do you think this is for large organisations? It's it's fundamentally a question of, of of will, or do you think there are kind of big structural challenges for larger organisations? I think it's it's really the whole the whole industry you know has this this problem across the board and there are major problems we have in, in both the pipeline but also in kind of every single part of the funnel of getting people into and including people in tech companies. So I don't think it's necessarily a question of will. I think it's it's really about um, you know making sure that you get it right early. I think the, the slight challenge that those companies have is that they're so late on in their development that. They haven't got that kind of culture really embedded from day one. Mm. Yeah. You mentioned Monzo. Are yeah. there other examples that you can cite in terms of, I mean, it, it, clearly this is a work in progress for most organizations, but are there other companies that you, you, you uh, did some research on that you, you, you'd like to talk about maybe? Yeah, I mean, there's a few companies that we've talked to who are specifically building for audiences that maybe don't, that are not represented in the tech industry today. So Beauty Stack is one of those uh, companies which is, you know, still a relatively small company, um, but it is run by Sharmadine Reed, who's this amazing kind of inspirational role model. And she's talked about how diversity is in their DNA. Yeah. And they got it right, you know, really from, from day one. And they've really mm. been conscientious about thinking about the composition of their team because the products that they are selling or their services that they're selling are targeting um, women particularly, uh, and it's sort of to do with beauty and nails. And so they need to make sure that the people in their team have that empathy with the customer. Yeah. Is that, I guess also that's, uh, maybe you could take this, Nicholas, that's also just about understanding. It's, a, it's almost like a product decision as well. If you're yeah. building a product, you need to make sure that it's got as wide a kind of marketplace as possible. It, yeah. it's, it's just, so, so, so clearly that's something that just, you know, all people working in product need to be thinking yeah. about these issues, right? Yeah, big time, because representing the, the customer base. And I think it's also, you know, both, um, you know, product design, uh, but also I think it's also um, uh, you know, understanding your, your, your customer base is, 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 is really hard for, you know, like beauty stack is like, I would, I mean, I have a background in product design. I don't think I would be really good in doing beauty stacks products because I don't, I would, I wouldn't re uh, resonate very well with, with, with the customers. So I would probably be lousy in that. Uh, probably be lousy anyway, but 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 um, so I think it's, this is really really important. But I also think about you know so this product, but also you think about the the environment, and it's also kind of coming back to this big companies versus startups. And there is you know we talk about feedback loops and data, and what I think what's going on right now is that you talked about the Facebook issue, and and it's not only Facebook; it's a lot of companies. You have you know, Uber and, and a, a bunch of these companies which are very successful today that were started maybe you know, 10 years ago when this was not discussed on stages, yeah. uh, on, on conferences. You yeah. didn't have this. So this was not like in, when they, th these companies were founded a long time ago or mm -hmm. some time ago, this was like, it was about 
move fast and break things mm -hmm. and wear a hoodie. And, and, and then you build a culture, and then you have a massive company. It's really, really hard to change that culture. What I observe today is that there's a bunch of founders who are just getting started. They see that and say, like, I don't want to build that. I want to build something different that yeah. is sustainable for the future, mm -hmm. that has a, have a value set that can be sustainable. And diversity inclusion is, is, is critical to that. So that's why I'm really, really optimistic that the next generation of companies that are being built here, you know, founders that are here at Slush, mm -hmm. this is like on top of mind. Yeah. And presumably, this also means that you know, if the industry opens up to diversity and inclusion, there's a massive talent pool out there that we're, you know, we're just simply not appealing to and yeah. it, it is excluded from the industry. Yeah, and I think, I mean, another great example, I think, is Glossier. And we had a great quote from Henry Davis of Glossier in this report. Uh, and that's a company which is just growing incredibly quickly and probably you know, is targeting an area that hasn't really been touched by tech before. So, you know, created a new beauty brand. A lot of their products actually come from comments from Instagram, from their customers. And initially, they started out as a, as a media brand. So you know, the fact that they were able to really have that empathy with customers from early on has created this amazing culture that's incredibly aspirational for people to go and work for. So we talk a lot about you know, gender and race. I think the other area that maybe we need to think about is also sort of socioeconomic yeah. um, sort of challenges that people who simply don't, haven't had the opportunity maybe to sort of like learn about tech. Is there anything in the report that kind of touches on that and how, how that could be addressed? Yeah, uh, so one aspect of, of that question is, is how you look at um, evaluating your kind of sourcing of candidates and looking at, you know, if you just take MBA candidates or MBA students yeah. or people who went to certain kind of Ivy League universities, then presumably and, and, and you're not necessarily going to get the, the broad swathe of society. Um, we just talked about interns and Diversity VC runs an internship program uh, which is for young people from all kinds of backgrounds to get a foot in the door at some of these places, which they otherwise probably wouldn't get the opportunity to work at. And there are now two people working full time in the venture industry who've come through that internship program. So we're quite excited about that for ourselves, but we think that that's an area that companies should explore when thinking about talent and, and hiring for aptitude rather than hiring for a tick box. Mm. Nicholas, from your perspective, do you think VC is still sort of dominated really by uh, you know, what Czech was describing, Ivy League schools, mm, uh, yeah. you know, people who've been through yeah. MBA programs at, you know, prestigious universities. Yeah. yeah, I think we need to be very uh, introspective and realize that the VC industry itself has failed on this. It's, it's, it's um, tradition has been very, very skewed towards uh, men, you know, coming from you know, Ivy League universities. And, 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 and also a lot of these VCs, you know, we've had a stereotype what a, a great founder should look like. Yeah. And, and uh, that's not a diverse kind of open-minded uh, outlook. So we have a lot to do in our industry ourselves. And, and what we have observed is that having um, uh, in, uh, members of the v a VC team who come from diverse background, you know, females, but also from a different cultural and ethical background, um, finding companies and entrepreneurs of that diverse background. So in, in it's, like, it's not kind of rocket science that a, f a female investor probably will actually find easier to find female uh, founders. And I think one part of that is psychological safety. Yeah. That I would think that, that um, female founders find it more comfortable having a conversation with a, with a female partner at a VC firm. So one thing that's important for us is to, to recruit uh, more diverse set of um, in, um, members in, in Atomico because that's the, thing, the way for us also to be more better at diversity in, in the ecosystem. So we're, we're kind of running out of time. We've got a few more minutes. I've got a couple more questions um, that I think would be, it's important to touch on. Uh, check it. Obviously, everyone's going to have this, uh, 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 this report available to them online. Um, but people going, leaving here today, what, what advice would you give them in terms of what's the first thing you can do other than reading your, your excellent report? Where, where do people start, especially people, you know, founders who maybe don't, you know, they're working in relatively small teams? Yeah. So I think getting together as a leadership team, getting together as a founding team, messaging to your investors and to your board and to other stakeholders around you and saying, you know, in 2019, we are making this a priority. 
Uh, just you know, putting that statement of intent out there is really important. If you can publish it to the rest of your employees, even better. And then opening up some sort of feedback channel or some sort of open channel of communication with your employees to help you know, inform what that policy is going to look like. Um, and then I think, you know, hopefully, you will read the report and find some, some good things out there. But there's also so many organizations working on this. I mean, I'm just kind of one tiny bit. And you know, this has been created by a whole group of volunteers. We've had 60 contributors yeah. to this. Um, and it's amazingly been this sort of huge team effort. But there's 28 different organizations in the UK alone that we've just identified that are working on different aspects of this question. So I'd also encourage you to look around you and see you know, who are the great organizations that are doing things and how can you sponsor them? How can you partner with them? How can you give them a platform to come in and talk at your workplace or in your community? So uh, one final question. There's a lot of tech bashing going on at the moment out there. Um, but let's not forget the amazing, amazing progress and the amazing kind of changes that the tech uh, has, has driven over the last sort of 20 years. Um, can tech play a role in mitigating bias in recruitment, bias in, in hiring? Just as a final question to you both, maybe Nicholas, yeah. you can start off. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, there are, today, there are several tools that can to, to help you to, um, um, for example, in, in to, to think through, or not think through, but also to help you to sc scan when you do jo job postings to take away words that are gender loaded, but also to um, when you get your ap applications to kind of to scan, anonymize them, to take out any kind of diverse or, or gender background. And it, it's, it's already proven that if you take away, if you initial screening of a CV, if you take away anything that has to do with backgrounds or gender, but also cultural background, ethnic background, th then you will screen, um, uh, you will get through much more diverse um, um, CVs. So it's really scary, we as humans, we have this unconscious bias. Yeah. And this, so that's, so, so this, so, so that's, so of course, like, but there is also, I would just start with like, let's just go and use, get some unbiased training to start with. So we, there are tech tools and there will be more tech tools for this, but I think we need to start with our humans and, and our attitude towards this and th understand that this is something we need to start with today. Mm -hmm. And even for a small company, you should not think that, oh, we need to focus on our basic, we don't have time for this. It's actually now when you are a small company that when you set this from the beginning, and think about diversity, and also the first few people that you recruit are from a diverse background, then organically will be diverse. Mm -hmm. so, so, so I was thinking, yes, there is tech, but start with yourself. Okay. Yeah, I think tech is such an amazing force for social change and for you know, being able to do the most incredible things. And this you know, should be something that the tech community can also tackle. It's not hopefully that hard. So I, I'm really optimistic about how much we can actually work together collectively and, and you know, start to solve some of these problems. So if you have any companies, you're working on anything that you think we should include in this guide, please do get in touch. So guys, it's a free resource. It's a very powerful toolkit, a very practical guide for all the entrepreneurs out there, all the investors out there to actually really try and make a difference. Uh, thank you both, both for your work. Uh, everyone, there are copies of this around. If you can't pick up a print copy, uh, please do go to inclusionintech.com uh, and uh, you'll find the whole report there. Thank you so much. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.